Hi, everybody. This is Matthew Pose uh, with Pose Acoustics, and I got a question from Antonio H567. He gave a $10 donation, so thank you. Um, he says, thanks. Question for you, Matt. First, thank you for all your videos. I find them highly thought-provoking, and they help me think through things related to my theater room. Since your last couple of videos covered subs, I thought I'd ask something that I've been thinking about for a while. I couldn't find an answer when I searched for one. When you talk to your counterparts, including Gene and James Larson from Audioholics and Anthony Grimani, is there any consensus as to whether there is a difference in sound, good or bad, if you mix ported subs with sealed subs? So I think that there is, but I suppose this is going to be debatable. You can absolutely mix sealed and ported subs and make things good, but it is really hard to do well. And it takes a lot more work to get that right. Anthony only makes sealed subwoofers and sealed speakers. If I owned a speaker company, I would only make sealed subwoofers and, and sealed speakers. Um, I know, for instance, that uh, Prolisten only makes sealed subwoofers, and while their speakers, they offer some of them imported versions, they intentionally made them able to be sealed because the feeling was when used with subwoofers, the performance is better when they're sealed. And, uh, and that's the consensus from Dan, at least. He, he definitely favors sealed, as do I. And his ported alignments actually are very unusual. They're more like a QB3, which is sort of like a, a quasi-sealed behavior with some of the benefits of a port. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, those types of experts seem to favor sealed and keeping things all sealed. And I know that's not exactly what you asked, because you said mixing ported and sealed, but they would favor that. So Ascendo produces kick subs, which are ported, and then all the infrasonic subs are sealed, which is as it should be. Um, and then they also offer a number of not truly infrasonic, but capable of infrasonic sealed subs. And by design, their systems are meant to incorporate mixing sealed and ported, right? So you might argue that Jeffrey then doesn't favor it, but is okay with it. And there are advantages to ports. Um, I think that you can overcome those limitations in other ways, but there's no denying that there's an advantage to a port. James Larson, I think, would argue that it's difficult, and he probably would recommend against it, but he's not a, he's okay with it. Gene um, has ported and sealed subs in his room, so he seems to be okay with it, right? So I think in terms of consensus, they're all over the place between these people, but some favor it, some not. From a technical standpoint, here's the issue. At the port tuning, the response is going to now be out of phase um, with the response from the other speakers that are sealed at that frequency. So you end up getting this phase cancellation at those low frequencies. Like in the case of Gene subwoofers, you're talking about stuff below 20 hertz. So you can lose a lot of your really deep infrasonic bass. And the fix to it ends up being you could use an all-pass filter. Or what I often do is I flip the phase back and forth on them. Um, until I, and I look at which combination of phases gives me the best response down there, because that's really hard to fix down there. And then what's going to happen when you're doing that is up towards the crossover point, you're going to see that you're going to get one scenario where you have more deep bass but less upper bass. And then another scenario where you have better integration over most of the zone and better upper bass but worse deep bass. So then what I do is once I get the better deep bass, because that's like pretty much unfixable, I then play around with the actual degrees of phase um, until everything is as close to correct as I can get it. Um, with more advanced DSP capabilities, we would get into all-pass filters for that upper range, and then that would get it optimally integrated. That's, that's effectively, that's what Gene has done, because he has all-pass filters in his amps. There are no all-pass filters in Storm or Turnoff processors. There are no all-pass filters in the majority of DSP systems on the market, in fact, which is uh, that are used in residential spaces, at least, which is tough because on one hand, they're really useful for things like this. And on the other hand, they're hard for people to use when they don't understand how they work. Um, so, I mean, I think the answer is I recommend against it unless you know what you're doing. But if you're going to do it, there's ways to make it work like Gene has done. From a sound quality standpoint, I think that ported subs are inferior to sealed subs. I've already said that many times. That's my personal belief. I don't like them. I think that they have problems, and I prefer sealed subs. Some of it is group delay. Some of it is just the noises that ports make. I am yet to hear a ported sub of any design from any manufacturer that did not have port problems at some point. And I, to me, just in the exact same, so when people try to argue, they're like, well, but you get so much more efficiency with the ported sub, and so I prefer that. 
because I would have to use so many more sealed sobs to avoid it. Well, I would make the counter argument. You actually would have to use so many more ported sobs to avoid ever hitting the point of port noise, which happens way before the driver is overloading in most systems. And when it doesn't, you've got a different problem. You have port resonances, which are honking and they're awful. And so you end up having to have the exact same problem. There are subs actually sitting in this room. I won't name names because I chose not to review the product as a result of this, but there are subs in this room where the maximum SPL that it passes, for instance, for both the compression test and the uh, burst test is actually on the order of 9 dB higher than the point at which its port noise is audible. And so even though officially it passes the test, I would reduce those numbers by 9 dB if I was to go by the audibility of the port noise. And when I used it in a room, it, it was very audible to the point that I found it unenjoyable. With music that doesn't really push the low frequencies, it worked fine and it sounded pretty good most of the time. But with movies, it was really bad. And even though it wasn't designed to be used this way, I shoved some foam into the port and then I ran all the, you know, watching it again. And I got to tell you, it definitely was overloading the woofer, but I never heard it. <laughs> like it, it, the, the overloading of the woofer was sort of lost in all the other stuff going on in the room. So... Like I said, even though technically it was overloading and there were issues, it was far less audible and offensive than the port noise was when it was chuffing. Um, we did a, a subwoofer for a project and, you know, it's the headroom is there. So it, it, I think it works OK. But to me, it was bothersome. So it uses a large 21 inch driver in a massive enclosure. It's a it's coffin sized. <laughs> and literally, it's even kind of shaped like something you'd put a person. In. It's kind of creepy. So it's a giant, giant woofer. They're end fire. And they've got a huge port because it's got a ton of excursion. There's like well over 35 millimeters, I believe, of X-Max on this driver. So lots and lots of air displacement requires a very big port. And these were meant to play really low. So the port had to be tuned really, really low. So really big slot port tuned down at like 15 hertz. And what happened was it caused the port resonance to be down in the operating range. It's like 60 some odd hertz, I think. Well, you have to cross them over at like 35, 40 hertz to avoid exciting that port resonance. And when I first set them up, I, I kind of knew in the back of my head, but I was hoping that the effect would be largely inaudible. And I crossed them at 80 hertz and it just sounded awful. And every time we were playing music and it would hit those right frequencies that would excite those port resonances, it just sounded like I would just describe it as like a low frequency honking noise coming out of the sub. So I lowered the low pass filter on just those subwoofers with the big ports down to something much lower. Uh, I think it was 35 hertz. And now I don't have any of that extra dynamic range and, and output that I really was hoping to get above 35 hertz that those 21s could contribute over the dual 12 modules we had on the front. But it did add a lot of really low bass dynamic range and I didn't have the honking noise anymore and it sounded better. And it was everybody was happy with the end result there. But that, that honking thing just reinforced for me why I don't really like ported subs. Because to make that work, we had a problem. And you might argue, oh, well, it was a badly designed port. Well, here's the issue. Had we made that port smaller and raised the uh, resonant frequency up over 100 hertz, then it would have chuffed. And then we wouldn't have been able to use them at any frequency at the amount of output that we needed because of the port chuffing. Even with those giant ports, they still chuff. It's just that at a level that's so high, it's not really a huge concern. But again having used that same driver in other scenarios, I like it better sealed because the sound of the distorting overloading woofer is not as offensive as the sound of the chuffing port. So I still stand by my view. I don't like ports. I gave up on them. Earl Geddes gave up on them for the same reason. It's not like I haven't used them and I just don't know what I'm talking about. I have used them. I was a port ported sub person because of the advantages they have in efficiency and excursion control and even distortion in that excursion control region for years. But I was always fighting a problem that I kept thinking, well, there's a way to fix it. We're going to fix it with multiple ports that are tuned to different frequencies. We're going to fix it with a lossy medium in the port. We're going to fix it with different size ports, blah, 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 blah. In the end, none of it worked. There was no fix. I moved on to a different approach. I started using um, base radiators. So that's like a, a woofer cone that isn't actually connected to a voice coil on a motor and it resonates just like a port, like the mass of air in a port. It's a, basically a mass on a suspension. And it had its own problems, including those overload. And they produce a lot of mechanical noises. So in the end, I thought, you know what? Just do a sealed sub. In fact, from a cost standpoint, a subwoofer driver 
with a um, uh, passive radiator is roughly the same cost in many cases to produce as a subwoofer that just has two woofers in it. And then you get the extra output that the port would have given you in the first place. So anyway, um, I hope that was helpful, Antonio. Thank you for the $10. Subscribe, like these videos, keep on watching. I got more coming.